Good morning. We're going to talk about the Roaring Twenties, but we're also going to do it in the context of The Great Gatsby, because I know you have a reading associated with that. What's interesting is that when we talk about the Roaring Twenties, we mean the 1920s, even though we're living in the 2020s. So we are talking about a story that's 100 years old, but it's in the context of, I think, modern American life in that there are cars, there are professional sports, there's mass media entertainment. So this really is the beginnings of what we would come to think of as the modern American experience. The other thing is that because Gatsby now is out of copyright protection, that it's out in the uh, 100 plus years old, so it's out in uh, public domain, we're looking at a story that's going to be retold many more ways. Uh, right now, there, uh, in addition to four movie treatments that I know of, there are a couple of comic books even that are retelling the Gatsby story. Um, the Scarlet Letter, which is early American literature, actually was made into a Japanese manga comic book. So this idea of adapting classic material is nothing new. But I think Gatsby will probably get more treatment as we go forward. There may be stage plays or even a musical in the way like Hamilton uh, was so popular a couple of years ago. So I want to talk about the Roaring Twenties. And I'll provide some comparisons to modern day so that we can understand American society. What was going on back then and use some things from today to kind of understand what was happening back then when Gatsby was being written. Remember, we're talking about a story that was contemporary in its time. So you have a story in the 1920s about the 1920s. So it was modern literature. It was current stuff at the time that it was hap happening. We look back on it and some of the language and some of the situations might seem like they're historical to us, but we have the benefit of living in the future. But at the time the story came out, that was the way society was operating. So I'll give you a little bit of perspective about that. One thing is history does not line up into perfect, neat little decades. So we don't say that the 1920s were from January 1st, 1920 to December 31st, 1929. In fact, the period is a little bit longer than 10 years and its ends are not exactly even. So you see here, I mentioned that November 11, 1918 was the end of World War I. Now notice in my notes on the slide, they called it the Great War because they didn't know there was going to be a World War II yet. So even the way things are described, you have to think about it as to when it was being described. So really, the 1920s are the period after the First World War, and they go through the stock market crash, October 29, 1929, that started the Great Depression, because that's when the roaring really ended, because almost everybody was broke. So what's happening is... We define history between important events. Nowadays, when we talk about the post-war period, we typically mean after World War II. We talk about post 9-11 because the terrorist attacks of September 11th, 2001 marked a societal change. So we do history in chunks between one major event and another one. Now, the second note I have on this slide shows that the prohibition of alcohol in the United States kind of overlaps with the Roaring Twenties. So if you see there, the 18th Amendment to the Constitution outlawed alcohol starting January 16, 1919. So it's a year after the war ended, but it's a year before the 1920s. It really started getting enforced because the necessary laws were passed. 
in 1920, prohibition really becomes something, but it runs on till 1933. But the idea of alcohol prohibition and sneaking around to get a drink and smuggling liquor and what it does for organized crime, that is another backdrop for this period. So we have a happy period of people being out of a world war. So all the men have come home from the war in Europe and business is getting going and money is flowing. And even though it's not legal, people are sneaking around and having a drink and a good time. So it is sort of a peppy period that's going on that is the backdrop for what happens in Gatsby. We think about business, and some people say the business of America is business. So a lot of things can be defined by commercial activity. Well, during this period of time, there are a couple of business trends that are mentioned, oh, by the way, in Gatsby, and it's something that it helps you to know about for your reading. First, there was the rise of chain stores. It used to be that in every community, it had a bank, a grocery store, a clothing store, whatever it was, but there was one of them and it was locally owned and controlled. Gosh, until the 1970s, uh, Panama City, Florida, where I used to live, was pretty much like that. There was no out of town money. There were no out of town chains of stores. But it's in this period that this idea of J.C. Penney's or Walgreens or Sears having stores in all the major cities became a big deal that a corporation would plant its stores in many different cities. So if you went from one city to another, if you went from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia, J.C. Penney was still J.C. Penney and you knew what kind of store it was. You didn't have to deal with the locals. Obviously, having a big operation like that meant big money. So that's a thing that comes up in Gatsby. It's mentioned as a way that he gets his money, something for you to think about. Another thing that's going on is that people could buy stocks. They could play the stock market and they could do it on what was called margin. But basically it was on credit that you could buy stocks today and not have to pay for them until the end of the month or the end of some contract period, which meant that you were betting that this stock was going to go up. You could sell it, make your profit, and then pay off your debt out of your profits. So the stock market was very much gambling, but gambling without money in your pocket. Uh, one of the golfers I used to follow said pressure is not trying to make a putt to win the U.S. Open. It's trying to make a three foot putt for a ten dollar bet when you only have five dollars in your pocket. That's pressure. And I think that's kind of a good illustration because people were buying stocks hoping that everything was going to go up. And at this time, business was hot, so things were going up. So people were figuring that uh, they could cash out and pay off what they owed because everybody thought everything always goes up and everybody always makes money. And at, by the end of the 1920s, we find out that's not true. But this is a time when it seems like everybody's making money. Everything is always positive. Everything's always going up. Just in case you didn't know, those young ladies are wearing bathing suits of the day. Not what we would think of as being the Sports Illustrated swimsuit magazine, but there you have it. But the whole idea of having a Miss America beauty contest was put on as a promotion to get people to come to Atlantic City. There were contests such as dance marathons where people would compete to see how long they could keep dancing to win big prizes. In fact, up at FSU, uh, still today, but when I was going there and teaching there, dance marathon was a big charity fundraising event that a lot of the fraternities and sororities would do. And this was a time when people were making money so they had leisure time 
This was new. So they played games, Mahjong, which is sort of, uh, let's say it's Chinese uh, dominoes, and crossword puzzles were becoming big. So you have people who are making money, who have leisure time, and many of the people in Gatsby are what we would call the idle rich, the bored rich, who are looking for something interesting to do to pass their time. And these sorts of activities and entertainments are part of what we're talking about. Aviation was a big deal. And one of the early things that happens in the book is a reference to uh, taking a seaplane flight. In fact, there's a company here in Volusia County that, uh, that builds seaplanes, or at least there very recently was. But part of what happens is that the men who flew in the military during the war have come back to the United States and they have this skill of flying airplanes and airplane technology is getting better. So what will we do with this? And a lot of the World War I flyers would come back and they would do stunt flying for entertainment. And there were many air races and prizes offered for who could fly the fastest from one city to another. This is the picture of Charles Lindbergh, the first man to fly by himself from New York to Paris. So setting those kinds of records were a big deal back then. And aviation was the equivalent of what we would think of as the space program today. It was new, dangerous technology, and it was thrilling to read about and to read news about. And airmail and passenger service were just getting started. And in fact, here in Daytona Beach, we have Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. It was actually founded in 1926 by one of these veteran pilots and a business promoter who had the idea that they could make some money off of this idea of flying and giving flying lessons. And they started out up in Ohio, but eventually brought it down to Florida to train World War II pilots down in Miami, and then eventually brought the thing up here to Daytona Beach. So we really are kind of tied into this big technology development. but it certainly held the public's attention. Jazz is important. We often talk about the period of time when F. Scott Fitzgerald was writing as being the jazz age. Later on in this term, we'll take a look at some of the writers of what was called the Harlem Renaissance, which is a neighborhood in New York City, which had many African-American nightclubs. Cotton Club was one of the famous ones, but this was a very cool part of the city to go to for dinner and shows and poetry. There was a lot of intellectual activity going on, musical activity. So again, the idea of Americans needing to be entertained and finding it in this time uh, in the musical medium, the genre of jazz. So this was another thing that provides background for you in the 1920s. Sports are certainly important. This is a time when modern American sports is really starting to exist, but it has a couple of ties into the Gatsby book. Now, we just had the college football championship game last night as we're making this recording in Georgia defeated Alabama. At this time in the 1920s, College basketball, or excuse me, college football was really the big thing. Pro football was kind of a, a dirty, greasy sport, people playing under fake names for two different teams. Uh, pro football was probably more like pro wrestling back then and was not really considered respectable. We have a picture here of Red Grange out of the University of Illinois, and when he signed with the Chicago Bears, that was the biggest college star of the day, signing with this new pro football stuff that made it kind of legitimate because if they could get the best famous college guy to play pro football, pro football must be okay. You probably have heard of Babe Ruth, the most famous player in baseball of those days, but why was he so especially important as a big home run hitter and a large personality? 
because the previous year in 1919, there was the scandal of gamblers fixing the outcome of the World Series between the Cincinnati Reds and the Chicago White Sox, which then became known as the Chicago Black Sox for the scandal, people getting banned from baseball. And there have been movies made about that as well. Um, Eight Men Out and Field of Dreams have connections to this. But the reason that's important for Gatsby is one of the characters Gatsby runs into is based on the real life gambler who had a hand in fixing the outcome of that 1919 World Series. So for us, it's history. But for Fitzgerald, when he's writing Gatsby, that's recent news. That's a hot scandal that he has woven into the background of his book. I also on this slide mentioned golf, which we don't think of as one of the big sports. But at this time, boxing and horse racing, and in fact, even professional wrestling was selling out baseball stadiums. So the sports that were popular were different then than what they are now. But I mentioned that Bobby Jones was the biggest star in golf of his day. And when he won the Grand Slam, the four top tournaments of his era in the same calendar year, notice it was the top professional tournaments in the US and in England, but it was also the top amateur tournaments because Sportsmen being amateurs was still considered the highest form of sports, that you weren't doing it for the money, you were doing it for the purity of the game. We have the Winter Olympics coming up next month, and we have all kinds of professional athletes in skiing and hockey and uh, figure skating who are participating. But that wasn't the case. Olympic sports were totally for amateur sportsmen. The highest you probably would be would be a college athlete. But anybody that ever got played or paid or uh, won prize money in a sport was considered somehow shady. So the idea that to be the top golfer in the world would include winning two amateur tournaments of top rank. That was the way things were. And we have a character in Gatsby who is not only a golfer but a professional, and on top of that, she's a woman. So think about it today. We're very used to Serena Williams or the WNBA or women's pro soccer, and sure, we accept that women are playing all kinds of professional sports. Women's tennis on TV oftentimes has bigger ratings than men's tennis. But consider in Gatsby's era, a woman playing professional sports. My goodness, what a scandal. What a racy thing that was. So that gives you a little angle on this character that when you read about her in the book, you think, OK, she's a woman. She's playing in a golf tournament. She's making some money. Yeah, OK. But back then, that was a big deal that made her a remarkable and different kind of character. In terms of the news and media, Television wasn't around yet. Obviously, there wasn't any Internet or anything like that. But radio was becoming the main thing. By the end of the 20s, commercial radio was really where commercial television is today. With dramatic programs and comedy shows and music shows, radio was not just one record after another or continuous talking. It had a schedule of programming. Movies were becoming a major medium, and because people still were infected with celebrities, fan magazines and gossip magazines about which movie star was dating which person and who was getting married and all of those kinds of things, that sold a lot of magazines about the entertainment industry. So very much the kind of thing that you might see on your phone when you uh, open up Google or Yahoo and it's suggesting stories that you might be interested in and you see there's a lot of entertainment in there, this is what was going on in Gatsby's time. That 
who was being in a movie or in a play and who was going out with who else. All of those things, that gossip and talking about people for uh, the entertainment value of just talking about other people, that was, in fact, uh, a very contemporary thing. So in that way, I guess society 100 years ago was not that different than society today. Now, earlier I mentioned about prohibition and the whole idea of alcohol being illegal turned a lot of ordinary Americans suddenly into criminals. Think about it. If today it's perfectly all right to go out and have a beer or have a glass of wine or have a cocktail at a restaurant and then tomorrow it's against the law. Do you think people would stop that habit immediately? Or do you think that they would sneak around and try and find places where they could still go get a beer or go get a glass of whiskey? Obviously, the number two thing is what was true. The idea of ordinary Americans still wanting to have a drink and now it would be illegal meant that many, many Americans had some brush up against an illegal activity. Uh, just continuing our local connection. Daytona Beach, of course, is the home, the origin of stock car racing. Well, a lot of the early stock car racers used to be people that drove liquor for the people who were brewing it, who were uh, distilling it illegally, and they would run the liquor through the hills of the Carolinas and Virginia and such to get it out to be distributed. So you had to have a fast car and you had to be a skilled driver. So souping up your car to make it extra fast and hiring the best drivers you could, that was just good business for the people who were involved in illegal alcohol business. And then those skills, what will you do with them once liquor is legal again? Well, I got a fast car, you got a fast car, let's go race them. And people started buying tickets to see these races and suddenly we have professional stock car racing. So there's just another local connection to something that was going on back then. But the idea that we needed to move a lot of illegal alcohol around the country to get around that it was no longer legal for people to, to buy a drink or to produce alcohol, the people that were providing that service were criminals. And with any criminal enterprise, whether it's drug dealing today or alcohol dealing back then, it becomes a large amount of money. And because it's a large amount of money and there's competition for it, it certainly can become violent. And one of the things that we can think about in these historic terms is that really the beginnings of what we think of as organized crime came out of the prohibition of alcohol because criminal networks became created in order to produce, transport, and distribute these alcohol products, either um, on a wholesale basis or a retail basis in illegal nightclubs. So you almost had to have a criminal network to have alcohol production to continue. And with that amount of money and competition, then organized crime was going to be a thing that was going to happen. So then even after it becomes legal, these criminal networks still exist. So they may as well get into gambling or prostitution or illegal lotteries, other kinds of rackets, simply because they have this network that is accustomed to operating this way and they will continue doing what they were doing. 1929 might have been the high point or low point, as you think of it, of organized crime, because on Valentine's Day, February 14th, one gang essentially slaughtered members of another gang. And this was an ethnic dispute as much as anything else, 
because on the north side of Chicago was the Irish gang and the Italian gang had the south side of Chicago and they were having conflict over who was going to control the liquor rackets in different parts of the city, who was getting into somebody else's territory. Later on in the term, we'll also have some literature that looks at the American immigrant experience. And there's kind of an overlap right here, too, in that if immigrants come in and are not welcome in legitimate businesses and trades, then turning to illegal activities almost gets forced on them, some historians would say, because they weren't welcome in ordinary business. So in these close-knit communities, having the rise of illegal organizations that then would get into competition and conflict with each other, today we would call that an unintended consequence, but back then it, it wasn't so much a consideration, and it, it just grew and grew and grew until these sorts of activities, this gang warfare, became part of the American scene. And just I wanted to close with a bit of trivia for you. Prohibition still exists in different places in the United States. Now, this map is from 10 years ago, but it's the most recent map that I could find that really showed county by county where there were different alcohol restrictions. So the blue counties are called wet meaning that alcohol sales are totally legal and you can buy liquor yourself. You can get a, a drink in a restaurant or a nightclub or that kind of thing. The yellow ones are what's called a mixed county where there are some prohibitions about retail purchases or days of the week or limits on what can be in certain types of establishments. Even here in Florida today, um, if someplace serves alcohol, but over half of its revenue comes from food, it has a different license status than a place that has over half of its revenue in alcohol. So there are still legal things that differentiate how alcohol is bought and sold. But you see, there are still some counties that are called dry, and those are the red ones where the actual purchase of alcohol is prohibited. And if you look very closely, you'll see that there are a couple of those red ones up in Northwest Florida, where it was actually a thing that people had to do. They would drive out of Washington County down into Bay County, and they would come buy their beer or whiskey uh, just over the county line. It was not uncommon and you see back in my home state of Texas, a lot of yellow counties and some red ones, that liquor stores were called county line liquors because they knew they were just over the limit from a county that didn't allow liquor sales to where it was, and they knew that people were driving back and forth over the line to make their purchases. Kind of a silly system, but that's the way things were done. And in some places in America, that's still the way that things are done. So now you have some background information about what was going on in society at the time of when Fitzgerald wrote The Great Gatsby. And I think that gives you a little bit more understanding for some of the references that you might see. Gatsby, of course, is one of the most studied and read novels in American history. Even though it's a very small book, only nine chapters, not very thick at all either. But there are so many details packed into it because Fitzgerald is writing to an audience that is living through the things that I just talked about. So if he makes a reference to the Great War, well, everybody who's reading the book knows which war he's talking about because it just ended a couple of years ago. So almost everybody living either was in it or had a family member or knew somebody who was in it. So when he makes a lot of these references, 
he's speaking to an audience that already knows halfway what he's talking about. And I thought it would be useful for you to know something about this time period so that when you have those readings to do, you can interpret it better because you have an understanding of what's going on. Next week, I'm going to take this into a little bit further detail. I actually have some satellite photos and things to show you exactly where Great Gatsby took place. So we'll take a look at those parts around New York to give you a little bit of a geographical fix on what's going on in the story and where the characters are, uh, sort of like drawing a picture on your test when you're doing a word problem in math that uh, if you have an illustration maybe it makes more sense to you so we'll take a little look at geography next week to see new york in the time of gatsby and sort of to fix some of your landmarks that are mentioned in the story that'll do for today i appreciate you uh, coming in for class if you hang around for a minute if you have any questions i'll take them in just a second.